Morning. Morning, everybody. Um, just a little bit of history. We're a purely a, uh, a feed yard. It's a family operation. We do not custom feed. We only feed our own cattle, and we try to do a integrated backgrounding and farming operation. The front end issues, if you're looking at setting up a feedlot and going into the feedlotting business, you've got to create a business plan, you've got to select a site, design your pens, understand the production issues and do it where you can get staff. And I keep coming back to staff availability. Our industry is being chiselled at all edges by the mining industry and if you haven't got stable staff, on a 365 day a year business you are not going to make a profit. Define your market. If you haven't got a market we don't put a beast in the feedlot. We, if we want to gamble you might as well go to the Gold Coast and gamble in air conditioning. Why would you do it in flies and dust? And if you don't plan to make a profit I'll guarantee you you won't make a profit. It doesn't just happen, you have to plan. Feedlot industry from owning your own feedlot and feeding your own cattle is a highly capital intensive industry. It's in excess of a million dollars per 1,000 head of cattle. And coming back to the stable staff issue again, if you haven't got stable staff, you will not have high performance and you won't have a potential profit. You really need to have that stability in a feedlot. You have to create a whole team around you you're not smart enough to do it all by yourself. You have to take in a whole lot of consultants to give you advice before you start and during your operation. The first is that you have to have your accountants, your bankers and your financiers to sign off on it. You don't want surprises halfway through. If you're building one, you don't want to find your run over budget. You don't want to find that the cattle market spikes and you've got to find another half a million dollars somewhere to acquire cattle. You need to engage your engineering consultants. This is critical to make it work. You need environmental and constructions. The environmental people will tell you how to design your feedlot as well as if it's going to work in your area. For example, it's not by chance that most of the feedlots in Australia are on the Darling Downs or in the western New South Wales or the Riverina. It's because of environmental factors and the availability of grain and cattle. You try to build a feedlot east of the Great Divide, you're destined to fail. You try to move up into central Queensland or northern Queensland and you are going to have a very hard job ahead of you. You need to have a nutritionist with you and a veterinary consultant. If you don't believe your nutritionist, you shouldn't start. Because if you try to change what he tells you, you're nearly guaranteed to go toe up. He will give you a ration and it will be a least cost of gain ration and you need to stick to it and you need to be regimented throughout your feedlot to measure everything incrementally. In other words, you need to uh, monitor what you're feeding and how you're feeding it. You need to have a dedicated team. Everyone used to not go into dairying because it was 365 days a year. Feedlotting is 365 days a year. One of the ironies of feedlotting is that you get much less sickness on Saturdays, Sundays and a Monday if it's a long weekend. I can't work that out, but that's one of the ironies of feedlotting. And the other thing about it is, don't try and reinvent the wheel. This industry is a great industry. It uptakes technology very quickly and the people in it are very open, are very frank and are very honest with you and they'll tell you their mistakes and their successes. So when you go to do, if you are going to build a feedlot, then don't try and reinvent the wheel. Go around and see a number of feedlots and I'm internally indebted to the people that were honest with me when I first started. Selection of a site. The, the site location is critical. If you don't understand things like humidity, rainfall and temperature and their effect upon production, then you need to get someone to tell you how it's going to work. You need to get access to regional weather forecasts. And this is the type of data that we record every day at the feedlot. You'll notice date along the bottom here, relative humidity here, uh, your, rain, uh, your rainfall and temperature there. Now you'll notice along the bottom here the blue is the rainfall. You get a little spike in rainfall. You come here and you find your humidity goes up but not very much. But just have a look at your maximum temperature. It was low there. So that 
type of thing will not cause a heat stress situation. You move along a few days later, you get a spike in temperature, but you've had no rainfall and you're, you are getting where you can get heat stress. Now, there is ways of accurately looking at charts and that with this, but the point that I'm trying to make is that you've got to get into an area where that's not going to affect your production. Now, you can alleviate some of these by putting shade and things like that into your feedlot. That will be a nutritionist and part of your consultant team will advise you on that. The supply. You'd be surprised the number of people that do not have a very safe long-term water supply for existing feedlots, let alone potential new ones. It has to be of good quality and it has to be high security. And you need to go and talk to DNR if you're contemplating starting up a feedlot. The consumption is approximately 24 megalitres per thousand head and it has to be not stock and domestic. It has to be part of a Pacific allocation under this new water uh, plans that are in Queensland. Your proximity. It's, once again, it's not chance that they've developed on the Darling Downs feedlots because they've got a close proximity to grain. Really what you're doing in a feedlot industry is an energy conversion business and you'll hear me repeat this time and time today. You are converting grain energy into muscle and fat. You need to be close to some byproducts if you can because the feedlot industry historically started off with byproducts in America. In Australia if you're close to Dolby you may be able to get some of the byproducts out of the ethanol plant. We're close to Warwick we get hominy which is a byproduct out of the corn uh, plant there. You need to be close proximity to supply of cattle and uh, I can't stress that as fuel in the last six months has been very expensive. If you've got long haul cattle you're going to pay a penalty and a lot of times that can be your profit in the domestic market. Closeness to abattoirs. A good example of this was we supply Woolworths 365 days of the year and have been for about 12 or 15 years. We were killing down in New South Wales at Tamworth. They shifted us to Queensland uh, and we put $10 per head straight to the bottom line just on a freight component. So your close proximity to your market or your abattoirs is critical. Once again, I come back to the access to reliable staff and reliable tradesmen. I spoke to a very large feedlot in Queensland a few months ago and I said if you had your time again where would you build your feedlot and they said as close as we could to a major town where we can get staff. Tradesmen, one of the most important people you'll find in your feedlot is your electrician. Everything is electronic and it's going to get more and more and you need to have access to a good reliable tradesman and fairly quickly if you need him. The other things that you need, simple things that might sound so obvious to you, three-phase power, an all-weather access, and then the last one is soil type. You can build a feedlot in Queen Street if you've got enough money, and the government regulations allow you to do it um, if you've got enough money and you can implement all the requirements. You try and build on a black soil flat and you're going to increase your cost of designing and building that feedlot significantly. The same goes, you can't build it where you've just got a sandy ridge. And today you've got Howard Oswald here, Howard built our feedlot, and I'm sure Howard will give you a few pointers if need be on regards soil type that you need for a feedlot. Heard our John speaking before, it's a business about managing things, and if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. And we are paranoid about measuring things at the feedlot. We measure every month our power and our water supplies, and every day we record tractor hours that are used in feeding and we record fuel every time any vehicle is filled up at the feedlot. And it gives you a, a very simple handle on your costs. Pen layout. This is always the, the coal face that everyone wants to get to very quickly. We've gone for a pen layout which is 30 metres wide, 70 metres deep, a drain at the back and a feed bunk and a road at the front. The water trough is always about two-thirds of the way down the back of the pen and these are all laser leveled about three degrees to there and a very slight cross fall as well. In future I believe we'll be pen scraping with laser leveled uh, buckets. Some feedlots are already doing it and I think that's going to be part of the future. 
your, your actual design of your feedlot is critical. Here we've got a three meter apron at the back of our bunk. The bunk is very straight and the pipes or the uh, bunk rail is in the middle of the bunk. If I had my time again, I'd pay and have it at three and a half or four meters. That's your highest maintenance point along there and around your troughs. Your bunk capacity and your bunk drainage. Along the back of these pens, you can see that three metres, and these pens are all put in with laser level. All of our bunks have got a fall from one end to the other with a laser, and what we find is that in wet weather, if your feeding is fairly close, most of your water will run out of there, even though we do have knockouts at the back of these. Your bunk size is absolutely critical. You need to have a large bunk and wherever possible try and feed once a day. We have changed over from twice and three times feeding to once a day feeding of all of our cattle and the bunk capacity has to be big enough to take that once a day feeding. Uh, if you don't go to once a day feeding except in wet weather where we feed a 70-30 or 80-20 you find that you're in, on a small feedlot you're constantly mixing and your engine hours on your machinery will go up and your cost of each tonne of ration will increase. On the previous slide you will saw how our bunks were very straight edged. Some of our bunks in the paddock weren't and they were our earlier types and they were the ones that we bought in from a manufacturer off site. Those bunks do not align properly and where that alignment occurs you get a fungus build up and it's very simple matters like that that can cost you every day of the year, 365 days of the year, if that's not cleaned. Your yard design. There's very, very good uh, availability of plans for yard designs on the internet. There are, we use a system called a Temple Grandin system and you can download the total system off the internet. We use a lots of uh, solid walls in all of our uh, yards up in the uh, working area, in the induction areas. All of our concrete is cross-hatched, we have a wash area and very simple little things like how you design your gate catches, how you design your, your gates so that they're easily removable, easily repairable if you need to and we've used drill stem which is about 8 to 10 mils throughout the whole feedlot except for the internal posts which are wooden. Workplace health and safety. I want to impress upon you that you can't do this all by yourself once you start to get into a significant number of feeding cattle. And workplace health and safety is an issue that's going to bite us all in this industry. We use walkways outside of all of our uh, heavy areas up in the crush and up in the forcing pens. We use lots of black matting and metal and we have man-proof accesses wherever possible to get out of there purely and simply to prevent someone being hurt. It doesn't mean that you'll stop everyone being hurt but you'll lessen the risk and if you do go before the courts you're going to get a much more sympathetic hearing than if you don't. On our crush, a little simple thing like designing right up near the neck, there's the head, there's the bulk gates there or the, the gates at the front and we do all our injections up in the front there and it's a very simple cut out on the crush. It's the cheapest meat that you're going to sell. It's going to be hanging up right down at the bottom of the animal when you're hanging by the back leg. So if there is any abscesses, that's where it'll be. And that's where you don't get men hurt. You don't try and go through the side of the crush. And that might sound so simple, but it's attention to this detail that will save you a lot of money and a lot of heartache. Animal welfare. We tend to gloss over this issue for a long time. Good animal welfare will give you good cattle performance. And how's that shown up? shows up in lower health costs and better gains and better performance and the the better weight gains and the better performance is what we're in this business for items that will affect animal welfare are things like manure management we have a program that every eight weeks we clean the pens providing we've got a rain event to suit that if we're going any longer than eight weeks we'll come back and dry scrape our pens Catching cattle in the crush, and these are what I've tried to do is get it down to a very uh, simple little things with attention to detail. I was at one feedlot where they were catching cattle, and every third one was being grabbed on the side of the head, not on the side of the neck, and then they would go in and catch it. And then they said to me, Why is my performance post drafting poor? It's not rocket science, it's attention to detail. Shade, everyone will come to you and say, 
you need to look at shade and I think you have to look at shade. In our area we're fairly lucky that it hasn't been something that we've had to implement but I think if you're planning a feedlot you should design it so you can and our feedlot is designed so we can implement shade very easily. Animal welfare is going to be a much bigger issue in future and if the industry is not on the front foot with this it's going to cost us quite a lot of money but it'll cost us a lot of bad publicity. Once again if you cannot measure it you cannot manage it. At the Crush we use a flat screen computer it's been there about four or five years it's nothing, no major problems with it and we use stock aid as our program but there are numbers of those out there you must measure as many parameters as you possibly can to find out if something goes wrong. This is an integral part of your QA program on your feedlot. And for example, at our feedlot, every time we change a batch number, we do it at an individual animal, we don't do it on a day. So when we get to the end of a bottle, we use the program and we go up and change the batch number so that we have guaranteeing our supplier that we can go back to no, you know, beast one through three, and we can tell you at 11.21 and 36 seconds, that's when we vaccinate it with this batch number. So we're giving product security from that. This here will give you a very great handle on how you uh, make a profit in the feedlot and how you actually control your disease and everything like that. We use a very simple uh, thing called hip height, and I uh, say to you by using that, we are a domestic feeder and we only ever feed Jap Ox as an opportunity. If you can get at 1.2 metres hip height on your trade cattle, your chances of hitting the Woolworth grid are very, very high. And we've got these marks here at 1.1, 1 1.2 and 1.3. They're a very, very simplistic way of doing things and that's recorded on every beast that goes through our feedlot. We use, once again, you can see the concrete floor there, but we use an air sort gate, seven-way air sort gate. And by using a sort gate, it's about $18,000, and it allows the pensioner crew to come on. All of those that have got hair like me can come on and work the feedlot. And that allows you to set your animals up either on induction or during uh, processing or during drafting, and then you can join them afterwards. It's surprising how there might only be three or four of one of non-doers or something, you can push them back so that you're not redrafting them and redrafting them. So if you're looking at setting up a feedlot, I'd suggest that you give some serious thought to setting up an air draft as a way of handling your cattle. Handling equipment, we use a bork gate if necessary. Everything's hydraulic crushes. We use air tools for injections. We use air tools for uh, ear tagging and also for drenching and that sort of thing. Most important thing in domestic trade who we for, feed for is Woolworths is 80 cents discount for four teeth, 80 cents a kilo discount for four teeth. That bar costs you $1,500 or $2,000 and every time that beast's in the crush it is mouthed. And then we know that our number of animals not hitting the grid by getting a penalty for four teeth is dramatically reduced. So if you're going to do in the domestic trade, you have to consider some little practical things like that. Design summary, going through it again, we're looking at energy costs, and all I can tell you is that I believe this is only an aberration that we're seeing at the moment with energy costs coming down. They are going to go up. Labor is going to be a major importance for you, both in production and in maintenance costs. When you're doing the feedlot, do it once, do it properly. Pen layout and pad preparation, you can get very good design. We went over bunk shape and bunk size, and there's very sound reasons for that. Water and feed preparations, yards, workplace health and safety, and cattle handling. What business are you in? Well, everyone wears a pair of RM Williams, thinks they're in the cattle business. What you really have got is a whole lot of businesses. You're in the commodity business. You're in the energy conversion business and you're in the fields, the feed business or meals business. Your competitor is not the next feedlot, is not the next cattle producer. It's pig and chicken. And if you lose sight of that, you'll do it at your own peril. The commodity business, you're converting in the domestic trade about three quarters of a tonne of feed in the bunk into saleable product. And a lot of times that feed in the bunk on a sense 
per kilo of weight gain will cost you more than what you're going to get for that product when you sell it. Now I'll repeat that again so that it goes straight in. When you put the three quarters of a tonne of feed in the bunk over 50 or 60 days, the cost for that kilo of beef that you're putting on in the feedlot will often be more than what you're getting in a 55% a, a dressing weight for the sale price. So you're making your profit on the kilos that you bought into the feedlot, not what you actually fed. You have to understand that you have to have an efficient energy conversion business. The least efficiency that you've got in your feedlot is the one you should be looking at next week to try and improve on. And you only can do that if you have stable ruminal function. Now, it might sound crazy, but the rumen is going to tell you how that beast is working to convert that grain into muscle and fat. And to do that, you need to have feed intake graphs. And this is a simple graph that puts kilos per head along here. This is the number, this is the amount that's fed each day. This is your live weight gain along here. And uh, up here, if you look, you need about 4.5 to 5 kilos for a domestic animal to just allow it to be alive. It's called basal metabolic rate, and that's just for it to walk around, drink, and eat. And if you are only feeding 12 kilos a day, then you're only going to get 1.3 kilos weight gain. What you see is this same 4.55 kilos stays the same, irrespective of how much maximum intake you get into the beast. So the message of this graph is you have to aim for maximum intake. If you limit feed your animals, the proportion that this is of that goes up and you will make less profit. The only time you limit feed is if you're running a backgrounding operation or something of that nature. Now, I'm not talking about a custom feed yard here. I'm really getting back to what we do at home, which is feeding our own cattle. We're in the business of having least cost of gain. We're not in the business of selling feed in the bunk. Totally different business. Production is all about understanding and controlling the whole process. If you don't understand how it works and you don't control it, then you're probably not going to make a profit. Your grain handling and your grain milling. For example, buying wheat with 20% screenings, your cleaner will pull those 20% out. So you might as well have paid 20% more for it because you generally can't use it. Your roller mill. We set our roller mills up with a feeler gauge and lay on our back and get them dead parallel. It's that attention to detail that will get you your performance out of your roller mills. Every uh, about two years they go in and be refluted so that they're giving us maximum performance. On the mixer box we've got a set of scales there and we produce a feed out for the ration every day and this applies to every feedlot that's making a profit and that ration has to be adhered to and if they make a uh, a misdemeanor, we call them. If you actually overfeed or underfeed, you write it down and you record it so that you can trace back if there was a problem. And attention to detail is things like storing your hay. We store our hay, all of it, 100% under sheds. You cannot try and feed round bales as a cheap shed out in the paddock and put them through a mixer. You just can't do it. The other thing that we do with those is about four years, five years ago, we got rid of our tub grinder, and we do not buy any hay in now unless it's been chopped with a, a baler that's got choppers on it. And we went from about $30 a tonne to chop hay down to paying them a dollar a bale, which is $2 a tonne. And it just breaks up and you feed it, and we haven't broken a shear bolt for probably two years in the, in the mixer box. It's that simple little ability to adapt and attention to detail. When you become a feed uh, operator you can also get yourself in as a professional and you become a shitologist. And this will tell you what's going on in your cattle, it'll tell you what's going on with how you're feeding. This one here, for example, there's whole grains in there. That's simply telling you that your roller mill probably hasn't been set up properly. 
and every day under your roller mill, whether you're steam flaking or dry rolling or tempering, you should be monitoring that every day. And the person that's walking the pens or riding the pens should report back the moment they see something like that. If you see something like this, it's going to tell you that that animal is a non-eater. The little marks here are caused from the large bowel constricting before it's passed out. And that faeces is dry and that animal will be a non-eater and you go looking for him in the pen. It's, this is an art that you train your men to do. Pen riding and walking the pens is not something that you do to train the, the horses for the next camp draft. It's a pretty serious business and this is where you'll make or break a lot of times. If you get something like this, it gets a shine to it and a grey look about it and that can tell you that you're getting some post-ruminal digestion. Now your nutritionist will explain that to you and then you get something like this and this will tell you you're getting close to the mark. So you want to be looking through the feedlot every day at the same time and preferably with the same people and they will tell you the trends that are happening. If something happens you know where to go looking for it. You have to understand cost of gain. Cost of gain is about dry matter and energy density. If you do not understand those two words then you're going to be in real trouble. Energy density is all about how energy dense you've made that ration and how many megajoules of energy is available for that animal to perform on. The dry matter in a, in a bunk, it's very easy to sell a cheap ration or make a cheap ration if you just up the water in the ration. But if you wanted water you might as well let them get it out of the trough. I've just used an example here so that you see a $300 a ton, 30 cents a kilo ration as fed, picked a, a 7 to 1 feed conversion, that's costing you $2.10 for each kilo that's gained in the feedlot. If you sell that carcass for $3.75 at 54% dressing, you're only getting $2.30 back. So I'll go back over what I said previously to you, when you feed in the domestic market in the feedlot, a lot of times that cost of gain in the feedlot is more than what you're being paid for it. You're losing seven cents. So your profit in that exercise is the kilos that were on the animal before they came into the feedlot. And you're selling those at two dollars three. So you have to understand these equations. I've put up here a very simple little uh, spreadsheet on Excel and uh, your nutritionist can set you up with one of those so you understand it. So we've got one ration, corn say at 300, and another ration at 230 for sorghum. They've both got roughly the same dry matter. Your costs of your cattle are roughly the same. Your carcass weight sells the same. Then you get down here to the bottom line in red here. Your profit on this one is $12, so the dearer ration actually gave you less profit than the, the sorghum ration. And this sorghum ration is a dry rolled or tempered ration, not a steam flake ration, because most small feedlotters will be going along that route and your return is actually less on that cheaper ration because you're going to have to feed them for a longer time to achieve the profit. So if anyone wants to talk about them later, I just put them up as to give you the principles that operate, okay? So you need your nutritionist to get you something like this, you need to discuss it with him, and you should know what profit you're going to make before you put a beast in the feedlot. Domestic production issues. What we work on is when grain's expensive, we feed shorter. And a good example of that is that Woolworths lowered their number of days on feed when the grain got up very expensive from 60 days down to 50 days, purely because the cost of the beef was going to be so expensive. When grain is cheap, we will feed much longer. If grain gets down very cheap, we'll often feed for 70, 80, 90 days because that's the cheapest way it is. You have to understand food conversion. If you don't, you need someone to explain that to you very, very quickly. You have to understand uh, feeding efficiency with cattle and equipment. As I mentioned, we go to once a day feeding and you have to understand your mixer capacity and your efficiency. We just increased our mixer capacity by one tonne and we saved one mix a day. So just simple things like that. We changed tractors and we went to a common rail tractor and we went from 18 to 20 litres an hour down to about 7 to 9 litres an hour. So we will get a free tractor in about 8 to 10,000 hours just on diesel saving. So it's attention to detail that you need to go into. You need to be driven by data collection 
and John mentioned it here, feedlot industry allows you to capture a lot of data. You need to be making your decisions on that data. They can't be emotional decisions. Well, I'll explain to you, I think, or I feel, or I believe, you can't have that in the feedlot industry. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You aim to achieve maximum stable daily intake per head, and that's achieved by ruminal stability and you keep hearing that ruminal stability you need to get a stable rumen because that's the fermentation tank to give you the energy to put more beef on your beast we do graphs every day at the feedlot and to just show you this type of thing here this is date along here this is the number of head in the pen and this is their consumption and when we start put these in the pen you'll notice that they drop for the first day and then they got a very steady growth rate that's what you're after Pen numbers are very stable, we pulled one at that stage. When we got to here, we actually misread them and we pushed them a little bit too hard and we went up there for two days and bang, look what happened. What we should have done was keep that graph going up there. Now you need to do this, the programs for doing this are very cheap, are readily available and you need to understand what feed intake is. If you can keep that stable growth there on feed intake, then you will. These type of animals, you call them roller coasters where they go up and down. So you need to be computer literate or have someone that is computer literate to be in the feedlot industry. You need costing models from your nutritionist. You need closeouts per head, not per pen. And NLIS has allowed us to do that. Because we don't breed all our own cattle, we buy them from multiple sources. We are able to check out the sources, the buyer, the breeder, and we'll often reach the stage with some breeders that uh, look, we're pretty right at the moment we'll ring you if we need some. So you need to use the NLIS that's there now. It is a wonderful tool and contrary to popular belief, very few fall out. You need to understand shrink. And shrink applies whether you are custom feeding or whether you're feeding your own cattle. Shrink is the difference between the purchased weight or the weight that went into the feedlot minus their induction weight. And I'll go back over that again. It's the purchase weight, either what you paid for it at a yards or what you bought in the paddock, or if you are sending your own cattle to the feedlot, what was over the weigh bridge at that feedlot minus the induction weight. You need to compare constants. When we ship in any cattle, we keep them for three to four days before we induct, and they are always on a supplement plus hay plus a ration. And that way we're comparing all of our weights through their weight gain period before dispatch on a full belly. If you don't compare on a constant weight, then you're going to get variable figures. And so your data won't be any use. So we only compare on a constant weight. And the night before we're going to draft, we give 110% to that pen to make sure that those cattle have all got a full belly. How much does shrink amount to? Shrink can amount to four to ten percent and even higher on cattle, particularly long haul cattle. If we've got cattle coming in from a paddock where we've weighed them X the, the property over their closest weigh bridge and put them back over a weigh bridge at the feedlot or close to the feedlot, they'll often be six or eight percent shrink in those if they're on long haul, meaning eight or nine hours haul. And a lot of times your profit in feeding is that shrink. You kid yourself that you've made a profit on that mob. A lot of times it's been the shrink unless you get up and measure it constantly. And your commodity shrink. You're buying grain, you, you buyers will buy the best grain that you can buy. If you are buying rubbish grain with high shrinkage in it, the scalpings can pull off 2 to 15% quite commonly and we don't feed that, that just goes out into our area where we compost all our cattle. You have to, if you're going to go into this business in future, I think you're going to have to have uh, things like grain scalpers and grain aspirators so that you are mimicking the big feedlots only on a smaller scale. Backgrounding, it's a critical part of our operation. We started this about five, seven years ago. We try to do 42 days or longer. In the backgrounding system, we bunk train the cattle we found that bunk trained cattle will go from a starter ration to a finisher ration in 14 days 
if we don't bunk train, it used to take us 18 days. You'll get lower animal health costs, particularly lower BRD costs. But the one that you will pick up a lot on is the subclinical health losses. They seem to be less. They're the health losses where the animal doesn't quite get sick enough to pull him, but he's just a non-performer. The golden rule in feedlotting that I've found is that if they go into the sick pen, you're lucky to break even. And Kevy will tell you much more information on that later in the day. And backgrounding will give you a lot lower death rates in the feedlot. Managing the process, you manage it to make a profit. If it won't work on paper before you put them in, don't think that you can work an extra two or three hours a day and you'll make a profit. You're just doing it for practice. So you manage the process to try and achieve a profit. Thanks very much.